it is, it's a conscious decision to come together to worship, to devote time to God on a Sunday. Uh, and I invite you to ask, well, to listen for God speaking to you this morning or this afternoon or whenever. Uh, and expect to be both changed and empowered in some way when you focus on God's very presence in your lives, uh, both through worship and through the time together. I have a couple of announcements. Um, one really important one is that there are sign-up sheets downstairs in Loomis Hall. Uh, and coming up in a couple of weeks now is the annual Harvest Ham Supper. There are lots of volunteer positions to be filled out, filled in, uh, supplied and not only for preparation in the week ahead, it's kind of a fun time of fellowship and a unique opportunity to volunteer an hour or so or more, uh, hopefully, to uh, building the ministry of this congregation into the community. Um, additionally, after coffee hour today, and everybody is invited uh, to coffee hour, but after that, the worship committee will be meeting again at the parsonage. I, uh, just encourage you to go over the things we discussed and, and just to share really briefly, we talked about a new sort of community outreach or ministry or initiative through the season of Advent, uh, just to have this spectacular sanctuary open and available during the week for people as a, uh, to come in for a time of prayer and centering and respite during what can be a very crazy and busy season. So today's meeting hopefully will kind of pin down some details about that and you'll be hearing more about it in the weeks to come. And then following that um, is a meeting of, uh, I want to say consistory, but um, many of them are away, so it's kind of an ad hoc meeting. Of, I don't know how many besides me are on top of this, but my one year contract as a supply minister uh, expired actually as of September 30th. So we're a little behind the eight ball here, but uh, classes encourages and requires us to have a time of reflection on the past year and sort of uh, sharing conversation. Um, Patrick Woomer is coordinating that this morning. So I, w I would encourage you since it hasn't been a formal uh, kind of arrangement to this point, and that's on me as much as anybody else. Um, to, during coffee hour, just find Patrick and let him know how you think I'm doing, or how we're doing, and what your hopes are for the next year, whether it's to continue as we have or to change in some way. Um, that would be helpful for the consistory, for me, and hopefully for the congregation. So thank you. Are there other announcements that I have missed? Good. We come from many places to this place, from many life experiences and different family models to create this God's family. So let us center ourselves during the time of hearing the bells and the prelude to worship God together this morning.
Our help is in the name of the Lord who created the heavens and the earth and each one of us. So let us worship God together this morning. May God's face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. Peace be with you. Our call to worship this morning is printed in our bulletins. Please join me in reading it responsively, followed by the unison gathering prayer. Friends, we come not to be entertained, not to be needlessly humored, nor to remain the same. Rather, we come to be moved by new visions, to be disturbed by our reluctance to let things go, to be changed by the invitation of grace. We come with expectancy and hope. We gather in the life-changing spirit of Christ, and let us pray. Attend to our heart's desire, O God, for through our trust and praise we lay open before you all that we are and all that we hope to be as followers of Jesus. And so today we seek an experience of worship that will not only create space for needed changes, but empower these changes into being. Great God, be with us in all that we say and do, in the name of Christ. Amen. Our opening hymn is number 623.
I remembered to bring things, very important. I'm going to ask you, first of all, for, for uh, a moment to think about what you would need to be ready to run a marathon race or even a 5K. So let, let's make it simple and say a 5K. What would you need besides a new knee? Okay, I have that. So I brought with me things that I thought, I'll go back, um, would help me. See, I've got, I've got my cell phone in case I fall. Uh, let's see, because this is going to be a big day. Uh, so I've, I've got my cell phone. I've got my spare pair of glasses in case these ones fall off and break. Uh, let's see, I've got, oh, I've got an extra water bottle because you get thirsty. Uh, so that's, that's got to go in there, obviously. Uh, I've brought a book to read in case I finish early. Um, so, um, and I brought uh, my ID and extra tissues in case my nose gets runny. Um, uh, and I'll, uh, yes, I, I brought, I think I have everything I need to run this 5K. Does that make sense? Is that a good plan? Is that going to help me run faster or do better uh, carrying all that stuff with me? Would you be able to run across the down the block carrying all that stuff? I know I wouldn't. It would be really hard to run anywhere with all this stuff. Um, so I, I, the smart thing to do is just to set it aside and pay attention on making it to the finish line, right? Do what you've got to do. Run with the people around you. Keep track of where you are in the pack. And, and if you can win, to win but basically the important thing is to do your very best. So I, I would prefer to travel light if I have to walk down the block, let alone run a 5K. So uh, that brings us to the little bit of a story that we're gonna hear in a few minutes about Jesus and a rich man. There was a rich man we hear and it shows up not only in Mark's gospel but also in Matthew's. So it's an important story for us, because we hear it twice in the New Testament. Um, the rich man comes to Jesus after Jesus has been teaching all day and, and is ready to leave on his way, and he comes up and says, Jesus, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? I, I guess he really wanted to be happy and to be sure that he would win. Um, and Jesus said, Go and sell everything that you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and then come and follow me. Well, how do you think the rich man felt when he heard that he had to leave all of his stuff behind and give it to the people who needed something that he had more than enough of? Um, what do you think you would do if that was the answer that Jesus gives to us today? Well, the Bible tells us how the man, the rich man, uh, responded. He was shocked, it says, and he went away mourning or grieving because he had a lot of good stuff and he just didn't want to give it up. So, I think that takeaway this morning for us is to just hold our possessions lightly and to travel light in the world, not just the stuff so we can run the race that's before us, but also the, 
what we call baggage in life. If we have a tendency to get angry or upset or um, lash out, then we have to think about or just get sad all the time and sit and cry. Um, those are responses that are normal and healthy, but we have to look at them all through our life, no matter how old we are, and say, is this, is this what God wants for me? And how can we make it better? So whether we're running marathons or running the race to eternal life with God, let us take a moment this morning and pray. Dear God, some of your teachings are really hard for us to understand and to follow, even when we know it's what you want us to do. Sometimes they're much easier, like honoring our parents and not stealing or not hurting anybody. Help us no matter what we do with our lives and our belongings. Help us to show how much we love you and appreciate the gift of Jesus in our lives so that others may see and believe. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And in our worship, recognizing that none of us is perfect and our lives are not lived in an ideal state, um, we come before God, we approach God's seat of grace, confident that God will forgive and enable us to start again. So please join me in reading together the unison prayer of confession taken from today's scripture. Let us pray. God of grace and mercy, God of peace, let us collect our thoughts and feelings and focus them toward confronting the harsh realities of our time. No matter how wealthy we may be, we are often poor in spirit and fearful of loss, even self-justified in the revealing face of our possessions. Hear the lament of our confession before the great needs of our world. O oh God, enable us not to be resigned or powerless, but to make just and generous choices for the peace and well-being, indeed for the very life of others. And our prayers continue in the silence of our hearts as we contemplate how those words may apply to our own lives. Hear these words of assurance of God's continuing love. In the same way that Jesus looked equally upon the children and the rich young man with eyes of compassion, so too does God view us. For only love can set us free to truly give of what we have and to share in who we are. God's love endures forever. Thanks be to God. Amen. Hear now the summary of the law as Jesus taught it over and over again in so many ways. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your spirit, and with all your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two laws depend all the law and the prophets. This is the good news of the gospel. Therefore, let us stand together and join our voices as we are able in singing to the glory of God this morning. Please pray with me. 
Lord, as we hear your word, help us to listen with our ears, to understand with our minds, and to believe with our hearts. And help these words to guide our lives today and always. Amen. Today's passage from Job takes place during a conversation with three of his friends who offer him lots of advice, but they do not turn to God in prayer to intercede on his behalf. Reading from Job. Then Job spoke again. My complaint today is still a bitter one, and I try hard not to groan aloud. If only I knew where to find God, I would go to his throne and talk with him there. I would lay out my case and present my arguments. Then I would listen to his reply and understand what he says to me. Would he merely argue with me in his greatness? No, he would give me a fair hearing. Fair and honest people can reason with him, so I would be acquitted by my judge. I go east, but he is not there. I go west, but I cannot find him. I do not see him in the north, for he is hidden. I turn to the south, I cannot find him. God has made my heart faint. The Almighty has terrified me. Darkness is all around me. Thick, impenetrable darkness is everywhere. And from the, story, from the Gospel of Mark, the story of what we have to give up to fully serve Jesus. As he was starting out on a trip, a man came running up to Jesus, knelt down, and asked, Good teacher, what should I do to get eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked. Only God is truly good. But as for your question, you know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not testify falsely, do not cheat. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, the man replied, I've obeyed all those commandments since I was a child. Jesus felt genuine love for this man as he looked at him. You lack only one thing, he said. Go and sell all you have and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. <coughs> At this, the man's face fell, and he went sadly away because he had many possessions. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for rich people to get into the kingdom of God. This amazed them, but Jesus said again, Dear children, it is very hard to get into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astounded. Then who in the world can be saved, they asked. Jesus looked at them intently and said, Humanly speaking, it is impossible, but not with God. Everything is possible with God. Then Peter began to mention all that he and the other disciples had left behind. We've given up everything to follow you, he said. And Jesus replied, I assure you that everyone who has given up house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or property for my sake and for the good news, will receive now in return a hundred times over houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and property with persecutions. And in the world to come, they will have eternal life. But many who seem to be important now will be the least important then, and those who are considered the least here will be the greatest then. This is the word of the Lord. Be Our sermon hymn is number 563. Please remain seated as we sing it together.
Let us pray. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. My pages are all mixed up here. I'm going to take one second and sort them out. Because being ADD-ish, if I don't have a script in front of me, no telling where I'll wind up. So, huh, when life isn't fair, uh, I, that theme kind of follows through from Job, who is just trying to understand why his life has been ruined, and he's lost everything, uh, his health, his family, his riches, um, and the message that we get is a reminder that the first thing we should do when life is a challenge or we don't understand or it doesn't seem fair is to turn to God because God will strengthen us, God will be with us, God will uplift us, God will, what I told my daughter a week and a half ago, God sends angels when you need them. So look for those angels and trust them. And then that poor rich man who came to Jesus and said, what do I have to do? I'm, I'm ticking boxes here to have eternal life. And then Jesus gave him that answer that, of all things, cut him to the quick because Jesus has a way of needling right into what it is that really bothers us and pointing it out and making us really uncomfortable to have to face it. We can imagine that perhaps the man had been listening to Jesus teach. Uh, why else would he have even bothered to approach him? Because he probably heard and felt good about himself up to this point. He just wanted that extra edge. He'd probably been a part of that crowd that had been listening to Jesus, this new rabbi, uh, perhaps amazed at Jesus' authority that he spoke with even since the age of 12 when we hear that uh, he stayed back in the temple in Jerusalem while his family went on, and the rabbis, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the temple in Jerusalem were amazed at the wisdom of this 12-year-old. Um, or perhaps it was a fresh approach to life that Jesus was offering on both life and faith that was attractive to him, and now he wanted to make sure he got it right. And when he saw Jesus was about to leave, maybe he just wanted to get to the bottom line. What do I have to do? Um, what was the key part of those teachings that he could bring with him and make sure he, he did that right? He wanted to get to the heart of Jesus' gospel or good news that was coming for all Christendom. He says, good teacher, what do I have to do? Maybe the man was thinking, what more do I have to do? Maybe he thought, I'm a good person, as many of us do, and we try really hard. I know the rules, I, I know the commandments, and I have faithfully kept them. I try to be a good neighbor, I try to do the thoughtful thing, but something is missing, something keeps me unsettled, uneasy. What do I have to do? Let me find out. So to be honest, maybe he was actually looking for a pat on the back for being a good person, or perhaps a shortcut to complete faith. Maybe he just wanted that word of assurance or of praise that we all look for, for being a good and decent and law-abiding person, to hear that in keeping the commandments that he said he had kept since childhood, he, that God was proud of him, that he could carry on just being himself and doing his own thing, and he would be good. But, as I said earlier, you can't run up to Jesus and interrupt his journey if you don't expect to be challenged. I would give all of us that same word of caution. Somebody's phone. I've been waiting for mine to go off. I forgot to silence it. I hope it won't. If it does, it's probably my daughter. Um, but we can't even go to God in prayer and not expect a challenge in response, a push to grow or to change in some way on our faith journey. And the risk, as for this poor rich man in the gospel, is likely to be, as one commentator put it, um, sticker shock for your soul. K 
catches you up short and makes you question everything that you are and have been. What we had understood as sufficient, um, okay, is generally only the beginning of something deeper and greater in our lives, and it's hard. First thing that Jesus did to this man, or for this man, was to take the flattery, oh, good teacher, um, that he tried to get Jesus' attention with and threw it right back at him. He said, only God is good. Jesus wanted the man to see goodness as not something to obtain or to possess, but, but rather a goal to seek, to become closer to God. He was challenging the man's pride, in a sense. See, the mistake is asking what he could do, what he could do, instead of asking God what God would do through him. The same message that was trying to reach Job's and his friends, compatriots' consciousness, turn to God first. When Jesus gets to the bottom line with love and compassion, he told him he was only one step away, just one more thing to do. But the man absolutely couldn't take that step. It said he went away grieving because he had such good stuff. He couldn't trust God enough in that moment to give of what he had been blessed with to those who had not been so blessed and to follow Jesus. So a story. Uh, an American tourist in Jerusalem met up with one of the fathers, the monks who were in the chapel, who was in the chapel there, and the monk offered to show him around the monastery. There's a lovely monastery in the uh, the valley uh, that goes between Jerusalem proper and the Mount of Olives. It's an ancient kind of uh, orthodox monastery and getting a tour is very unusual. But on their tour, uh, he came to the monk's room and the tourists noticed that there was of course no television and no radio, only one change of clothes, one towel and one blanket, simple. And he asked the monk how how do you live so simply? And the monk answered, well, I noticed that you only have with you enough things to fill a suitcase. Why do you live so simply here? And the tourist replied, I'm, I'm just a tourist. I'm just passing through. And the monk said back to him, so am I, so am I. That's a different way of looking at our lives, that we are tourists passing through. Uh, I used to have a bumper sticker above my desk in the pastoral care office at the medical center that said, um, we are, oh, well, let me see if I can get it right. I should have written it down. Um, not bodies having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a physical experience. And that reminded me to change my approach when I left the office to go to a patient's room, that we are tourists, in a sense, on a spiritual journey together, embodied. And that's a challenge always, to pull together those things we think we have to have, those things that we think we can't live without. Do they possess us, or do we possess them? That's the question. Um, Harold Kushner, a Jewish theologian notes in his book, When All You've Ever Wanted Is Not Enough, um, that our souls are not hungry for fame or comfort or wealth or power. Those rewards create almost as many problems as they solve. Our souls are hungry for meaning, for a sense that we have figured out how to live so that our lives matter so that the world will be at least a little bit def different, hopefully better, for our having passed through. Our possessions, our wealth, our biases, that baggage that we carry can be obstacles between us and God. Whenever, whenever I fly, and I have flown frequently in the last 20 years back and forth across the Atlantic Ocean, uh, several times a year for family visits or for respite. Um, I realized uh, early on reading travel tips because I used to 
carry a lot of luggage. And then as the years progressed, I got lighter and lighter and lighter. And so now, no matter when I travel, I just take basically a carry-on for no matter how long I'm there. Um, because there's always enough. Uh, somehow that's the world, the way the world works now. Um, he, he wrote, if you want to get away from it all, don't take it all with you. Um, it's hard to let go of what you think you depend on, to let go of what we think we need in order to trust in God's grace and providence in our life, let alone that extra, extra, extra pair of shoes in case of rain, or that extra, extra shirt or whatever that you just never you wind up you never use. Um, well, uh, remember in the very beginning of Genesis, the story of the beginning of all creation, the, the second creation story, actually, there are two, um, about the human race. The, there's the story of Adam and Eve and the snake. That's the other story. Um, Eve is tempted by the snake to eat one fruit that was forbidden by God, right? And the promise was that if she ate it, she would be as wise as God, and that didn't make sense. Of course, of course, she wanted to share that experience with Adam. Who wouldn't? And Adam, of course, wanted to share it with her. Since the very beginning, we have been looking for a, a quick fix, a shortcut, an easy way to get to be closer or equal to godliness. It didn't work in the Garden of Eden. That's a, a wonderful sort of morality story. Um, it didn't work for the man who approached Jesus just looking for one thing to be perfect. Um, and it, it doesn't work for humanity as a whole or for us as individuals. It just doesn't. We're complicated and it's not that simple. To lead us to grow in our faith, God challenges us at the one point that we cannot give up. Think about that. What is the one thing that you cling to that maybe holds you back from a, a richer and deeper relationship with God? The man who approached Jesus couldn't let go of what he possessed in order to be possessed by God. He might have pleaded, why so much, Lord? And those are questions that we ask as churches uh, all the time. How much is enough to survive, to continue in ministry? When do we say we have enough to be generous, not just survive? Um, why not allow us to simply say a kind word or uh, do an act of compassion by helping someone else just, you know, every so often, and that should be good enough? Why not allow us to just put our name on a list saying that we are for God, absolutely, um, fly a love flag in your garden instead of actually being involved for God? Why can't God build his kingdom on good intentions? We all have them or even on our complaints, God, this needs fixed. We ask, why do I have to be involved? If I'm already doing my part, why do I have to help to do the part of another? Um, that rich man just was stuck. Job couldn't understand, his friends couldn't understand. The man who felt so much urgency by asking God for the insight that he thought would be easy, another box to check, he received sticker shock for his answer and probably walked away heartbroken with his head bowed down in misery. He had come so close, but he missed the opportunity. Imagine him looking over his shoulder as Jesus walked on with his disciples through grief and anger, I suspect, and perhaps some envy, thinking I wanted so much to be with them, but I didn't dare take the risk of giving up what I have to trust God. So listen again to the promise that Jesus makes to you and to me. For mortals, it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Whatever holds you back physically, spiritually, emotionally from making a total commitment to God let us be willing to deal with it and to take that final step to love God with all our heart and soul and mind 
and strength. That's today's challenge and blessing. Let us pray. Gracious God, we are listening because we are hopeful and eager. We all need more of your love and grace in our lives. Help us to drop what holds us back from accepting those precious gifts. Let us find the courage instead to follow you with all our hearts. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. blessings we have, for the changing seasons, for the crops and the food in our refrigerators, for the companionship of friends and families, and for the demonstration of your love for us in them. We thank you for the people who have taught us, inspired us, and encouraged us, 
for the health to be here today and the faith to trust you for the future. May these offerings and our lives be used to further your presence in the world. We ask it through Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Let us come before God with still hearts and open minds, listening for God to speak with us as we speak with God. Let us pray. Loving God, graciously hear our prayers. God, we come to you this morning invigorated, tired, hopeful, questioning. We come to you as people in your realm, looking for ways to love more deeply and care more intentionally. We come to you with a variety of gifts and abilities and interests. Energize us to give of ourselves and our gifts fully to our communities. Teach us to be more like Jesus by finding ways to take what we have and to multiply it. Allow us to find unconditional love for our neighbors so that we can provide for them in ways that are unexpected and profound. Encourage us to go beyond discussions about money and logistics and focus on our goal of serving you. Christ, we acknowledge that we accomplish in our lifetime only a tiny fraction of the magnificent enterprise that is God's work. Nothing that we do is complete. The kingdom or the realm of God is always just one breath away. No statement says all that could be said. No prayer fully expresses our faith. No confession brings perfection in our lives. No pastoral visit brings wholeness. No program accomplishes the church's mission. No set of goals and objectives includes everything. This is what we are about, O oh God, and we seek guidance by your spirit that we plant seeds that will one day grow, that we water seeds already planted, knowing that they hold future promise, that we lay foundations that will need further development, that we provide yeast that produces effects beyond our capabilities. We cannot do everything. And there is a sense of liberation in recognizing that, oh God, this enables us to do something and that we do it well, as well as we can. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning, a step along the way, an opportunity for your grace, oh God, to enter and to do the rest. We may never see the end results, but that is the difference between a master builder and the workers. We are workers, not master builders, ministers and disciples, not messiahs. We are prophets of a future, not our own. God bless us in our enterprises, in our search for what is right and pleasing in your sight. Hear our prayers this day for others as we uplift them before you in the silence of our hearts and in the fervent prayers of our minds and in our lives. Hear our prayers this morning, O oh God. O oh God, in the silence, accept our prayers for healing, especially for Jerry's daughter, Cindy, and her cardiac issues, accept prayers of thanksgiving for the lives of those who affect us today, and especially for those who have died during this season. May their spirits of love and the gift of their lives be an ever-present comfort to their families and loved ones. Oh God, hear our prayers of joy over the birth of the children of the next generation May they bring hope and delight. We ask for an ease of birthing and a joy in health for those who are on the brink of expanding their families. Oh God, hear our prayers of thanksgiving and support for the consistory, for the classes as we prepare to meet in the coming weeks. 
Hear our prayers that this church will continue its witness to Jesus Christ for the world in new and effective ways. O oh God, hear the prayers of our hearts, our minds, our strength, that they may be pleasing to you as we lift them up in Jesus' name and in his words, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is number 840. face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God lift his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen.